What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the Bituation Room Live. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini. If I might not be live for you, okay? You might be listening in the future, in which case, uh, welcome to your hour and change of not solitude. Um, we've got such a great show uh, for you today. Um, Deanne Smith, comedian, is here uh, by way of Canada and New York and all the things. Um, super excited to talk to her. We're going to get into some really fun things like AI warfare and how Trump is dismantling diversity, equity, and inclusion programs from beyond the Oval Office. Um, so yay, super fun. And then we're going to talk about, uh, in a, uh, at the end, our final fun segment. I don't know how fun it's going to be, but I'm going to have Deanne guess how much billionaires paid in taxes, specifically federal income taxes. Um, this is a class, this is a war themed podcast. All right. The class war theme podcast, in addition to actual out and out genocidal wars, uh, that we've been talking about for six months now. Um, but it, uh, there's, um, it's just a theme. It's a theme and I expect a lot of bitching. And I hope because it is nearly tax day, April 15th, that there will be nothing but bitching from everyone. And we shall all share in said bitching because I'm sure that all of you have a higher tax rate um, than billionaires. That's right. I said it uh, for sure. I'm, I'm actually positive. And if you are a billionaire and you're watching... Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. What are you waiting for? Come on, become a member right now. $10 gets you a shout out at the fart song, okay? Carl Eichen, what's up, dog? What you doing? You want to talk about genocidal war crimes? Um, but again, before we get into the show, remember, this is just a third of the show. My headphones are bothering me, and that's no one's concern but mine. Um, this is just a third of the show. Remember, we are also now streaming on Wednesdays for the patrons. Sorry, streaming on Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern for everyone. But for patrons, if you want to watch back, listen back. Also, Carl Eichen, if you want to get discounts on the American Prospect magazine, which is wonderful. Um, you want to get discounts on merch. Patreon.com slash situation room. That's how you do it. Um, and remember that uh, I love you forever if you become a patron. It is the best way to support this show. You Everything is ad-free once you do support this show like that. Um, and we also stream on Fridays. This is a new show for everyone. However, this Friday, I'm out of town. All right? So it's just going to be a patron uh, accessible episode. Again, free to watch live, but to listen back. You understand the idea. And again, when you become a patron, you get a special little icon, a special RSS feed. It explains how you get access to that. So it'll be great. But also coming up on the show, and I didn't even tease this, but my friend and journalist Arun Gupta is back on the program to talk about the Zaka group and the many um, fairy tale atrocities that happened on October 7th. Look, if there are 33,000 Palestinians who've been murdered because of the actions of a small group of militants, um, we should probably know what those actions were. And despite what we've been told, um, a lot of things that are alleged to have taken place did not, in fact. And so whether or not facts matter, um, I'm going to say they do. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say uh, they absolutely matter. Um, and if what should have happened, actually bringing people to justice rather than um, blanket collective punishment... Uh, you know, why don't we, uh, why don't we actually dig into what happened? So Arun Gupta has done a deep dive into the Zaka group, has done a deep dive into, um, the mass rape allegations and, uh, we will, um, put him to the test. He's got a lot to share and it's been, it, it's just wild. So again, um, if you're watching, um, if you're listening, show this podcast some love, five stars on Apple podcasts or Spotify and make sure to, like and share the stream and subscribe to this channel on YouTube and Twitch. What are you doing otherwise? I mean, what are you doing? With that, let's get into it. Woo, I am flying solo today. So this is What Are You Bitching About? Uh, 
All right. So um, I am bitching about my headphones being turned down, which has been the problem. <laughs> Everything's fine. So as we stare down into the watery grave of uh, the November election, um, I think it is important for us to remember money. Uh, I think it's important for us to remember capital and rich people and billionaires and how they vote. You know what I'm saying? Even the ones who are, um, you know, like uh, the Peter Thiels who are like, but I'm, you know, part of the LGBTQ plus community. They don't claim you, boo. It's okay. Um, but, you know, so what I'm trying to say is billionaires want to keep their money. Now, I know you out there are not billionaires because you'd be like, why would I need a billion dollars, let alone multiple billions of dollars? Uh, I feel like I would have all of my needs met. I need a house. I need health care. Uh, some fresh air would be nice. A car. Uh, that's about it, you know? Um, but see, you're not a sociopath, and billionaires are. And so the prospect that they would pay a cent more in taxes, even though they employ massive teams to get out of paying their taxes, they hide their wealth offshore, and their wealth is taxed completely differently, if at all, than you or I, they're still worried about their coin. And so when they stare down into November, remember, they're always going to go for fascism because fascism is going to give them a better deal on their money. And so anyone who thinks, and I know you're not watching this show, but if you or someone you love thinks that Donald Trump cares about the average working person um, or is a man of the people, he's absolutely not. He's a man of the billionaires. He's been raising money from them. They have been helping him out with his legal fees. And though, lo these three and a half years ago, a lot of them were sort of very thrown. They just like, they just weren't with January 6th. Just like not the vibe. You know what I mean? Not the vibe. Like I like, I want to protect my money, but like, you know, in a classy way. Um, they're now changing their tune. And so this was actually an LA Times report that's something that I've been suspecting this entire time. And the thing that we've been seeing, um, which is that billionaires will go for the, the best bang for their buck. So the Los Angeles Times put out an article, these billionaires abandoned Trump after Jan 6. Taxes are bringing them back in line. To name a few, Larry Ellison of Oracle backed former South, South Car Carolina Governor Nikki Haley in the Republican primaries. He's now reportedly moving back to Trump. Richard and Elizabeth Yulin, heirs to the Schlitz beer fortune, backed uh, Ruvener. <laughs> I'm just going to call him Ruvener. Ruvener DeSantis in the primaries. They're also back with Trump. Um, and you can only imagine there. there's, in fact, there's actually one more. Here we, wait. There was one more, but um, the graphic got eaten. So, yeah. Um, the point is thus. Uh, they hate our guts. They are afraid of us. They think that nobody wants to work. They freak out. And by they, I mean billionaires. Um, yes, I am a bigot against billionaires. Um, they think that uh, paying people a livable wage, paying people $22 an hour is an absolute outrage. They think we should re raise the age of effing retirement. But when it comes down to it, every Wall Street even Wall Street bros who aren't billionaires will always be like, nah, it's Donald Trump for me. So we're dealing with a completely ineffective genocide green lighting moron right now. Like we know that. But don't, for lack of a better term, get it twisted that the other side is licking their chops at the opportunity for Donald Trump to get back in office because he will, ex they, he will extend their tax cuts, and that's all they want. They want another PJ, okay? They had one. They were able to write it off, $60 million. They want another PJ. And if you don't know what a PJ is, get with it, okay? You're clearly not an influencer. So we're going to talk a little bit more about taxes later on and even some of Biden's 
proposals, but just this is us against them. This is the people against people with tons of wealth, more wealth than they could spend in a effing lifetime. And they want their boy back. They know who their boy is. And none of that will benefit us. It is only to benefit the rich and the already they've already bought our political system you guys have all you each have a ju- supreme court justice what else do they want what else do they want man you got to wonder what else do you want cuz you're inside rotten hollow miserable little fuck that's all i have to say about that let us bring in for the rest of the show wait before i do that let me bring you <laughs> into my little world. Um, You all know that I've been raving about Sunset Lake CBD, which is a vertically integrated um, farm and production company of uh, CBD and CBD products in Vermont, and that they are wonderful. And yes, we are 10 days out from, or 11 days out from 420. And oh yeah, they're having a massive 420 sale. Sunset Lake CBD, coupon code 420, gets you 30% off everything on the site. Okay. Um, again, I'm really into the tinctures. The good night oil is incredible. Helps me sleep, helps me get to sleep. The lotions dig in the lotions. They've got salves and things for like achy muscles. And they last year raised $22,000 for, uh, for cannabis criminal justice reform, and they're doing it again. So, uh, 4.2% 4.2% of all the proceeds that they make from their 420 sale is going to be donated to the Last Prisoner Project. So if you've been on the fence about Sunset Lake CBD, just get off it right now. Usually with coupon code Frantifa, you get 20% off. You get 30% off. Um, so go there, uh, sunsetlakecbd.com. And with that, Deanne, damn it. She is a Canadian comedian who you've seen on Last Comic Standing, the Late Late Show, or CBC, ABC, and BBC. Um, Their critically acclaimed half-hour comedy special, Gentleman Elf, is on Netflix right now. And Hannah Gadsby's Gender Agenda, uh, where they also make an appearance. Please welcome Deanne Smith. Hello. Hi. 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 How's it going? It's going great. And I can't believe you are hosting and producing the show all by yourself today. I know. I'm just like an angel. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes, but it's so good to have you here. I've been on some of your virtual stand-up shows, which I appreciate yeah. you continuing to do despite, you know, the the pandemic being like super over, but <laughs> no, it's been really fun to get to know you virtually though. I, I think we only met in person once and you're always bopping around. You've got shows in LA and New York coming up, but tell me now, uh-huh. Deanne, yes. what are you bitching about? Oh man. Okay. I'm, I'm bitching about so much. Um, recently I discovered a very severe pet peeve and I didn't even think I had them. Um, but I'm going to back up because I have a, I have another bitch that <laughs> I have a bitch, <laughs> you got a that, bitch that connects to taxes, uh, and how misspent our collective money is. We have national guard in the New York city subways. I'm sure you've talked about this. It's ridiculous. We don't need them there. It's just a fish fascistic show of power. And I, I want to ask you, I have three ideas myself. I want to ask you and your listeners. I'm thinking we got to, obviously we've got to fight back now. we got to fuck with these losers. And I'm thinking, what can we put in our bags? They're searching our bags. How are we going to fuck with them? I'm thinking cooked spaghetti. That's an idea mm-hmm. that I have. Um, just make them squelch through a warm Ooh. I love food. that. Uh, aligned with that is is peeled grapes. We're taking to to a sixth grade Halloween party level. Yeah. Ooh, their eyeballs. Officer, or just their like, eyeballs. I mean, unwrapped tampons. They could be dirty or not. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes. The feminist angle. The reproductive yeah. rights angle. Um, yeah. Oh, there's nothing in here but period blood. <laughs> it's just a. Uh, it's pretty chunky. This see, I'm a free bleeder. Just like start to go into it. Yeah. Um, you're probably a Republican and you don't know how the female reproductive system works. It works like this. <laughs> yeah. Here, let me explain. So every month. Uh, yeah. No. OK. So let me ask you a question, because when I was living in New York, there were armed guards at the um, like Times Square, basically kind of the more the, the busiest um, subway stations. Has Eric Adams now basically expanded them? to many, many, many different stations. 
I think this is a, a Kathy Hochul. I don't know how to pronounce her last Hochul, name. I think yeah. the, Hochul. I think this is a a, a governor mandated situation. I haven't seen them. I'm not sure which subway stations they're at, but uh, they're well, not. Good, they're not doing anything except bothering us. Here's what, here's what I think is my best idea. And again, I would love your listeners to weigh in on this. Yes. This one seems hard to pull off, but I'm thinking if an officer could reach into my backpack and pull out a framed photograph of themselves as a child, I would, I think that would, I, I would look them in the eye and say, this is when you had hopes and dreams. This is when you had a chance. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying, so Not officer searches my bag and I suddenly pro procure an image of that officer as a child and mean like, what's become of you? Yeah. A framed photograph. <laughs> <laughs> How about, okay, almost as good, but maybe a little <laughs> bit easier to do. Maybe just a mirror. Like, what does it look like? This is the face Ooh. of fascism. Yeah, a mirror is possible. That's much more possible than a framed <laughs> photograph of the officer as a child. But I'm trying to expand That's my so imagination like, as I think about the new world we want to create. Well, I like uh, how, like, you're just doing a magic trick on for officers <laughs> in the subway. Yeah, they don't deserve like, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's five dollars, I guess. Um, anyway. <laughs> Take um, your bag of blood and go home. The bag of blood. This is my uh, extended uterus, officer. This is how. <laughs> yeah. This is how that worked. The the original bitch that I that I came in here thinking about. Yeah, yeah. And this happened to me recently. Um, I'm in a long distance relationship. That's why I'm kind of bopping around between New York and LA. I'm spending a lot of time in airports, and uh, I was at the the baggage collection carousel, and I found myself so frustrated. By the fact that, you know, if everybody just stands back a little bit, we can all see all of the suitcases. We can help each other out. You can grab right. yours. Somebody might even say, hey, that's my blue suitcase coming up. Can you help right. me out? Of course. But instead, I'm standing there trying to give room. People come and they park themselves right in front of you. And it's I'm connecting. Oh, I I, hate that. I'm seeing everything right now in terms of like. American individualism, right? And exceptionalism and this like selfishness. Um, we got to do you organize. feel like in Canada they wouldn't do that or they don't do that? You know, I need to I need to be flying in Canada more to figure that out. I think there is slightly more of a collective spirit on the ground in Canada, and I feel that when I'm driving, especially. Mm. Um I, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a lot of like, go ahead and merge, we're all in this together, <laughs> we're all gonna get where we're trying to go. Um, but I have found myself in airports recently literally exclaiming out loud, like I'm like, we live in a society, do we not? <laughs> As, as they were cutting lines, as they're just thinking about themselves, I'm getting, I'm getting mad about. I it. feel like, I feel like you have to watch that behavior because when oh, you yeah. become older, like yeah. you can just flip and suddenly you're like the lady muttering, "We live in a society in an airport," and you're like, "Okay, like once we're hitting fifty, maybe we're raining it in. We're doing other things. We've gotten our like, you know, we're doing some wellness stuff. We've got our tinctures or sprays or something. I want to be just. I also. I want to be that woman who's just like draped in different shades of lavender and has hair that I'm never going to have. Just like generally long. or at the airport? Well, maybe everywhere, you know, yeah. just kind of like creating an aura around. Now I'm just talking about what I hope for my midlife. But um, I love that. I Here's my thing on that. Lastly, on the subway, when you're waiting on the platform, when you're like trying to escape the armed guards that are freaking you out, mm -hmm. can the person who leans in to see if the train is coming the person of the farthest, the closest to that train who leans over and sees if there's a light coming, can that person turn around and just go, nope. <laughs> like, <laughs> because we all are just, when I was in New York, we all just go, huh, huh, huh. And you're all leaning in yes. individually as if you're going to see something different when you could also be like, hey, is it coming? No. Okay. See, see how easy that is. Yeah. It's that collective spirit that we need. Not coming yet. Looking out for everybody. You don't have to lean forward. Exactly. Um, I love this. Um, now prepare to dive into a lot of heavy crap, Deanne. We've been following the genocide. So yep. uh, a lot of things have happened. A little bit on Israel and then a little bit on uh, the uh, potential, the future, if uh, Trump is reelected. Uh, this is the week where... So this was a week where we learned, and we haven't covered this on the show yet, just how 
to the degree to which the Israeli military is relying on AI systems to find supposed targets and then kill them, um, but not in such a precise way. Um, and that is, in fact, by design. Um, this is from the uh, 972 magazine and from um, an Israeli journalist who had this incredible 8,000 word article. Uh, his name is Yuval Abraham. And I want to like get, show you a little bit of how he explains two programs. One is Lavender and one, and one is Where's Daddy? And um, I'll dig into a little bit more from his article, but here we go. AI based system to create human targets to mark them. So what it did it, it, at its peak, according to sources, we've used it, it, it managed to mark 37,000 Palestinians in Gaza as suspected low level Hamas or jihad militants. Now, the way which is really interesting, 37,000, and there probably are about that many dead. Uh, I'm sure they were all militants. Here he explains. It works is, for, for people who don't know, like it, the machine scanned most of the population in Gaza, collecting, surveilling information, and it gave each individual a rating between 1 to 100, based on how likely the machine thought that individual belonged to a military wing. It has a list of indicative features, which are really small signs that could be like, somebody is in a WhatsApp group with a militant or somebody that replaces phones all the time that raise or lower your rating. Now sources or somebody uh, is in a kafia. I mean, I just you just put this in like terms of imagine if, you know, Zionist propagandists, if the ADL were to put a mark, an AI mark on all of us, it'd be like posted something about Palestine must be a militant anyway. This is said, and this is very, very important that this machine, when they were using it, the IDF knew that in approximately 10% of the cases, it was making what was regarded as errors. So it was marking people who were complete civilians or had a very loose connection to Hamas. It is an automatic system that looks for these targets when they enter their family houses. So it scans thousands of people that were marked by Lavender, by the AI machine, and it alerts the intelligence officers the moment they enter their house. And the Israeli military, according to numerous sources, carried out a policy of bombing these people using unguided missiles when they were in the most civilian spaces, when they were inside family houses. Okay. Um, here, let's Collapsing see. the house on itself and killing often, according to sources, the predetermined limit was up to 20 Palestinian civilians at the beginning of the war, Pair AI marked junior suspected Hamas operative. Okay, so I want to get into more detail about what he just said, but basically there was an alert. So not only does it scan and randomly put suspected militants um, thanks to this AI program, and this is, his reporting is based on um, a bunch of sources in the IDF, a bunch of soldiers who were like, you, we didn't even question it. This is just what we went with. We just, the computer told us, and those were the, those, like, that's where we bombed. And when he said this program, Lavender helped identify, like, sort of all of Gaza. And then Where's Daddy was this program that actually identified when these so-called militants arrived home. Um, they systematically, this is according to his reporting, attacked the target when they were in their homes, usually at night while their whole families were present, rather than during the course of military activity. According to the sources, this was because from what they regarded as an intelligence standpoint, it was easier to locate the individuals in their private houses. Additional automated systems, including the Where's Daddy system, revealed that for the first time uh, were used specifically to track the targeted individuals and carry out bombings when they had entered their family's residence. And on that... Um, they the dumb bombs, Deanne. We'll be talking about the smart bombs and dumb bombs. We just are we're a week out from seeing the world central kitchen, you know, uh, convoy bombed so deliberately and very. I mean, that is a targeted missile strike. Oh, those three strikes didn't seem accidental to you, Fran? Yeah, strange. <laughs> that was why three precise strikes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, oops, these things happen in war. So, the this is very different. This is these massive, um, I don't know if the dumb bombs are 2,000 pound or not, but these massive bombs 
that are used to basically level an entire building. And those dumb bombs were used in these instances where there were civilians present. So again, we could take this step by step. That idea that Hamas militants are using civilians as human shields is the complete inverse, just like pretty much everything the IDF says. What is actually happening is they are using civilians, um, not even as shields, just as collateral in order to get to the militants. And it is even more egregious and heinous than all that um, because of the, you know, we've always been wondering, like, what's the calculation? Like, how many Israelis have to be killed? How many Palestinians have to be killed to satiate this quest for revenge from Israel? And they kind of have a calculation when it comes to militants versus so-called so-called militants versus civilians um, when it comes to this program and this reporting. Um, they decided in the first two weeks of war that for every junior Hamas operative that Lavender marked, it was permissible to kill up to 15 or 20 civilians. In the past, the military did not authorize collateral damage during assassination of low-ranking militants. Mm, sure. The sources added that in the event the target was a senior Hamas official, again, alleged, with a rank of battalion or brigadier commander, the army on several occasions authorized the killing of more than 100 civilians in the assassination of a single commander. So just open war crimes. Um, but, Deanne, your reaction to just how stark and deliberate the murder of families is and has been. I, yeah, I mean, every day it's a new atrocity. Every day it feels like a new level of depravity. And the fact that this is this this is what they're telling us, it's like, holy fuck. Um, I've, yeah. I've been re-watching The Sopranos and I'm like slightly nice. struck by the fact that like, the mafia, do the mafia doesn't kill your family unless they're really trying to retaliate for something. Right? <laughs> it's like, it's just wild to me. Nice. And I, I need a moment for the fact that Where's Daddy sounds like a kinking, kinky dating app. And like, <laughs> Lavender oh. sounds like the event that they would put on. Like, God. They probably so are like, you look, even our AI is an ally, you know, with the LGBTQ plus community. Oh like, let's... God. I mean, I don't as, put anything. Pa I don't put anything past the pink washing that uh, Israel and its and its friends try to do. Yeah, I mean, it's truly like you know, being queer yourself, it, it, and also being I know against this genocide and having spoken out about it. Like the bad faith way that they weaponize, like the LGBTQ plus community or even their supposed allyship is so disgusting. Yeah. It's like the, I think the most gross, the grossest, the grossest bad faith, like laying a trans flag or like a rainbow flag over like what was once a Palestinian home. I just No, absolutely disgusting. And I don't fight with Zionists online, but they love, they love to unleash their worst uh, fantasies about what yeah. happens to gay people and trans people and what they want to happen. They love to tell you what Hamas would do, would do to you for being gay or trans. Or whatever. 100%. We're, we're away from the AI right now, which is, uh, I, I don't know. I, all I can, it's just a nightmare. This is my, this is my reaction. It's a nightmare. I mean, to me, it is the fact that this comes from not just an Israeli journalist, but sources inside the military, those who were, had to carry this out. It is so sickening um, it completely dismantles any remaining, any remaining shred of, but the Israeli army is the most moral army and they take care and aims to minimize civilian deaths. No, no, they're maximizing it. They're okay with hundreds of civilians dying so long as one Hamas operative is killed. And that I think for me has been what's so upsetting about some of the liberal Zionists that still hold out for like, well, you know, the IDF really tries and it's just those damn Hamas are so good at hiding in their families. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah. You need to fully embrace that this ideology, this settler colonial genocidal ideology is all about killing as many people as possible, mm -hmm. starving as many people as possible, making sure none can return to their homes. And right now there is, and we're not, I'm not going to get ahead of it, but there are ongoing talks in Cairo, Iran, um, which has been attacked by Israel, is now wagering and wondering whether they should counter strike. Um, but they're telling the United States, 
we won't if you organize an effing ceasefire. We've seen the biggest shift in public opinion in the last week. But this, you know, the, the, and I think thanks to obviously the not tragic, the heinous killing of those members um, of this World Central Kitchen, but this fucking AI machine, killing machine, is so terrifying, not just on that Hezbollah level, but really for me, what that means for the future of warfare. Like, do you think that the makers of this machine are going to be like, oh, oops, it didn't work the way we intended? I mean, first of all, it did, but uh, well, we're never going to employ AI in warfare ever again. No, they are. And this is what we see, what we're staring down in Gaza is what I think a lot of folks are staring down for future, if future ethnic cleansings. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's just heinous and terrifying and, and um, it, it, like, yeah, there's precision murder of civilians. That is the point. That is by design. We've always known this, but I think this program proves it. And to even the IDF who's like, I don't know. I, I like I didn't I didn't want to bomb this entire you know apartment building. You got to wonder. Obviously, it's on them as well. But to like not to not pull the trigger. But anyway, let's you know, move on. Yes. Well, was, just before we do, you you talked about liberal Zionists, and I have to say that I am not speaking to any anymore. But I did I did find a few in my friend circles back in oh, October, yeah. and at this point, it's like I'm not even disturbed. If I'm not even disturbed by your politics, I'm like I'm disturbed by how fucking stupid you are <laughs> that yeah. you can't see this stuff and put it together you know yeah like well that's the question is. is are they seeing this stuff you know i think there's so much good reporting out there but if it, it has the die been cast we're going to talk to arun in a little bit about the you know the stories that were spread is the die cast for these folks who've decided it's okay to kill millions and millions of people um so long as the state of israel can continue its colonial project like are they even listening or watching? Are they even paying attention? Like yeah. you'd want to assume if I was really in to like the ethnic cleansing, like, look, it's a sad, it's a tragic ethnic cleansing, but it's got to happen. I would be scouring, uh, you know, all kinds of news sites to support my, for lack of a better, better term, genocidal political stance. Cause I'd really want to convince people that I was right because it's a horrible stance to take. So I'd be like, you know what? Um, you know what I mean? I, if I'm going to be open with this or if I'm even in private, if I'm going to say it, I would want to support it. But I don't think they are. And that is, I think, part and parcel like how Israel would like it. Like that's by design. Yeah. yeah. Um, I forget about that. I forget that not everybody has the same information, but yeah. Or but wants to defend their shitty, their shitty yeah. views. Um, they'd rather not think about it. You know, it's fine. They're, la, la, la. Like that's that's much easier for them. But let's move on because I wanted to do this story from a while ago and we haven't. But, uh, you know, there's been a massive campaign against now DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, in the United States. Um, this is an ongoing campaign. And unlike I think what a lot of us imagine the sort of I think when, when we talk about culture wars, we talk about, oh, people are anti-woke or they talked about critical race theory. You kind of think it's all sort of hot air. It's all BS. It's all whatever. And we forget that actually, no, there are real world impacts. People, you know, book bans, um, targeting, uh, you know, trans teens, all that kind of stuff. There are real world impacts to all of this. And the same goes for the attack on diversity, equity, inclusion. One of the things other than defunding UNRWA, until 2025 that was passed in the House budget, their budget that they, um, excuse me, the a congressional budget just passed, was actually dissolving the House Office of Diversity and Inclusion. That was just rolled in to the government spending bill. Um, chill, super chill. And this is, again, part of this broader MAGA movement um, to protect the whites. Um, they got their way with the Supreme Court overturning affirmative action effectively, um, which we just don't really talk about that much more. But now if they get their way and they win an election, this is Axios is reporting some of the uh, some of the details here. Trump allies are plotting to go after uh, racists who are racist against white people. Um, longtime aides and allies preparing for a potential Trump 
second Trump administration are laying the legal groundwork with a flurry of lawsuits and legal complaints, some of which have been successful. Central vehicle is Stephen Miller's America First Legal um, that calls conservatives, uh, called the group conservatives a long awaited answer to the ACLU. Thank God. Um, the ACLU, which has defended conservatives many times over the years. But anyway, America First cited the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yep, all of this is a rollback to the Civil Rights Act. We are currently still living in the backlash to the Civil Rights Act. Um, in a lawsuit against CBS and Paramount Global for what it argued was discrimination against a white man who was a writer for the show SEAL Team in 2017. This is very detailed, but Deanne, to give you a sense, this is the kind of minutia that their legal team is going after. A white guy wasn't rehired as a writer on a shitty show. And they're like, oh my God, you hate white people. Yeah, a military propaganda show, I can only imagine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, well, well, number one, they think that the American military is full of DEI, right? And the idea that they would even hire people of color or women at that matter, to say nothing of how women are treated in the fucking military, excuse me. Um, but anyway, put, put that aside. They've had success. Miller's group sued to block the implementation of a $29 billion pandemic era program for women and minority owned restaurants, saying it discriminated against white owned businesses. So just in case y'all don't think that like people are already being targeted and, and the ways, the little ways that we try to like, you know, make up for this country's history of racism and or slavery to be more precise like those programs are already being gutted and gone after more of that um uh, in 2021, a federal judge blocked a $4 billion program to help black farmers. And earlier this month, another federal judge ruled that the Commerce Department's Minority Business Development Agency was discriminating against white people and that the program had to be open to everyone. I have so many thoughts on this, but <laughs> I, 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 it, it, I have... Here's here's my large thought, Deanna, and then I'll let you have at it. I, I feel as though uh, this is wild. Obviously, anti-white discrimination isn't a thing. I actually feel that even liberals dabble in some of this stuff when they jokingly say like, oh, uh, I have a kid of color, you know, because uh, like a white person will be like, tell me like, oh, well, I got to, you know, I have, my kid is mixed. So at least we'll get, you know, we'll get into colleges. And it's like, even that. That to me fucking bothers me. And I know good meaning, well-meaning people say that shit all the time. And I fucking hate it. But I think more broadly what this signals to me is that we need programs that are actually universal to all people because white people can't stop whining. Now, those universal programs will, will definitely help black and brown and, and mostly poor people disproportionately help those people but the secret is, like, that's our little secret. The open thing is, like, it's for everyone. Just like Biden just had a new uh, student debt relief that's oh, that's for everybody, you know, it doesn't matter, like, in terms of, like, background or income. It's for everyone. That's the kind of shit we need. We need universal programs because motherfuckers get so sensitive when something is deliberately targeted at, for women or black Americans and to try and right the systemic and historic wrongs of things like slavery and Jim Crow. Blah. I mean, you at least have some kind of solution. I'm just here like, we need to burn the whole thing down <laughs> and start over, I guess. And you you mentioned in our, our tech, I'm set up in a natural light here, a window. Um, the light is changing over the course of our hour. I am here as a white person to say that the only thing wh white people are under attack from is the sun, okay? <laughs> Th that's it. And it's a big thing, but we can put on sunscreen and deal with it. Um, I, I just always thought that was crazy, like that, you know, the so-called master race that, you know, God chose to <laughs> rule over everyone can't be in the sun on God's earth. Uh, yeah. That yeah. rotates around the star of the sun and the chosen. Anyway. It's almost as me. if white people are unnatural on this earth. It's almost... <laughs> But anyway, it's it's fucking scary, right? Like, I mean, we saw the ways that, you know, these fake lawsuits get elevated, right? The, you know, Colorado Baker 
uh, I, am I confusing or the mm. Colorado website designer, um, same sex couple solicited a woman's website design, uh, for their marriage. Never happened. Completely invented. Didn't even happen. And it successfully allowed people to now discriminate based on gender and sexuality. That that's, that's the kind of cases that are being heard by our Supreme court. Anyway. Um, it, if, I, yeah, I just can't stop thinking about like individualism, right? Like if, if if the rule is we can all just like discriminate against anyone based on whatever nutty belief we have, uh, I don't even know where I'm going with that. It's just a nightmare. Yeah, exactly. Were, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a matter of you getting to buy some uh, buy some Supreme Court justices, and you can be like, if you're a cat person, you literally go to prison. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we still listening to the Supreme Court is the main question I have. There's more of us than there is of them, right? How about, we should just be like, no. <laughs> I hear your no. ruling and mm, mm -mm. it's going to be a no from me, dog. Um, all right, let's bring in uh, for uh, to talk about his incredible work debunking the myths of October 7th, an investigative reporter who's been published by the Washington Post, Daily Beast, The Intercept, The Guardian, and Jacobin. Please welcome my friend, Arun Gupta. Arun. Hello. Hey. Hello. How you doing? Good. Good to have you here, Arun. Um, there, Thank you. Uh, so, okay, so here's, here's like, let's just couch this conversation in the fact that uh, facts matter. And it is important, you know, I think that for many reasons, when there's like a terrorist attack or, um, you know, some kind of atrocity, we tend to say that was terrible. It was bad. I don't know the deed. It was just bad. So can we move on and not talk about exactly what, how it was bad and whatnot? Um, and that's not flying right now when it comes to the events of October 7th because of how actually easy it is to poke holes in some of the accounts. And I wanted to start because you've had multiple pieces written and you have a forthcoming piece. I believe, where is it coming out? Yes Magazine. In Yes Magazine. And you've already got a piece up right now. We're going to talk about those claims of mass rape. But I really wanted to dig into this Zaka group, which was an organization that's an all-volunteer organization, very orthodox, that was on the ground and was sort of first responders uh, or not first responders, but the first people on the scene in some of the communities and kibbutzes that were attacked by Hamas on October 7th. Who are they? And why were they there instead of like an IDF forensic team? Like, what can you tell us about the people who were there and were like eyewitnesses first on the scene? Yeah. So, you know, obviously what we're witnessing is just mind boggling, unbelievable, uh, and there's lots of just horrifying stories that have come out over, over the last six months, you know, like things like uh, the flower massacre or, or these children just, you know, that look like concentration camps victims, skeletons who are being starved to, to death. Uh, you know, people are eating animal feed, just, just on and on and on. But the batshit craziest story is Zaka. And the way I explain it, Zaka is the intersection of Epstein Island and Enron and George Santos. So, <laughs> oh man, you flatter but, him. <laughs> so, so basically, like, look, in, in terms of the Israeli rape claims, it was a giant hoax. There is one uh, case that is completely credible, in my opinion, Am Amit Susana who was raped while in captivity, right? This is how rape as a weapon of war happens. When a population is dominated by an invader, you know, we, we've seen it in Bosnia and Ukraine and Congo, Afghanistan, you know, it's when a population is controlled. What Israel is claiming is this happened in like basically two hours during battles where 3000 people died, mm -hmm. that there was somehow this campaign of mass rape and what myself, and others have, have looked at, I've had a piece in The Intercept and, and these pieces in Yes Magazine, is that when you examine the evidence, it's basically a giant lie. And what's really going on is that this is an industrial scale version of Jim Crow rape hoaxes, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the worst atrocities during Jim Crow 
the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, killing of 300 African Americans, the destruction of Rosewood, Florida, the Scottsboro boys, the killing of Emmett Till, on and on. These were all rape hoaxes. And that is precisely what Israel has done. And like they don't deny genocide, right? We saw this from the very beginning. They're human animals. We're going to cut off their food, fuel, water, and medicine. South Africa uh, included 70 different incitements to genocide, statements mm -hmm. by the highest ranking Israeli officials and across society. So there are also Israeli officials who have uh, outright said that Zaka, there is ultra orthodox group, you know, sometimes the, the term Haredi is used, uh, who basically have taken the lead for the last 30 years to recover human remains after a mass casualty incident, right? Yeah. Israel is like the only government in the world that this stuff is, is privatized. And so they were allowed in after October 7th. Now, Israel is the second most sophisticated military in the world mm -hmm. after the United States. They have a whole unit, trained soldiers who are trained in how to recover human remains, how to preserve forensic evidence, and to do it under fire. They mm -hmm. were mobilized and then explicitly told to stand down. So what the real story is, is there are Israeli government officials who outright admit that uh, we depended on Zaka and their stories to influence Western reporters. The one official in Netanyahu's office, Eitan Schwartz, said outright, the entire state of Israel was focused on framing the narrative that Hamas equals ISIS. And the men of Zaka, the gracious men of Zaka, were instrumental in showing Western reporters what type of evil we're dealing with, what yeah. type of human monsters. And we, that, mm -hmm. and what he said, he ended with, that deepened the legitimacy of the Israeli state to act with great force. So they yeah. were using this atrocity propaganda to uh, give them the political space to carry out genocide. Absolutely. Well, well, because, and we actually saw this happen in real time um, where you had reporters kind of standing outside of a home and then they were being told something from a spokesperson, um, maybe a soldier, but maybe like a Zaka representative. And this reporter's not in the scene. They didn't see the things for themselves, but some of those, and you can be more explicit, but some of these claims and i think people remember were things like there were 40 beheaded babies there were uh, there was a pregnant woman whose baby had been cut out from her stomach um what even like children in ovens and something these, babies like, in oven uh, eight eight babies and children hung on a clothesline eight beheaded babies all of those are lies there was one baby 10 month old mila cohen who was shot in the arms of her mother. They were in a safe room and uh, uh, she was shot through a door. That's of course one baby too many, one person too many, but that is it. And these yeah. lies were coming from top officials. Biden was repeating these lies, saying that there were photos, even though he was told by his staff not to say this. And mm -hmm. he was saying it as late as December. So you have the president of the United States uh, basically spreading atrocity propaganda and it's all designed to make Hamas and the Palestinians equal ISIS because then it becomes this unique evil that has to be exterminated. Right. Now the story of Zaka it, and, and the role it plays is even just, it's so insane. Well, can it, hang on, before we go to it, because I just want to, when you say that they have trained forensic teams but didn't use them, you know, some of the reporting you've done, and I, I you know, we talked about this Haaretz art article on the show before, was that they were, there were body bags that were just like, oh, here's a body bag with three arms in it. Here's a body bag that's, mm, there are different people in this bag. There's remains but not labeled. And that there are images of Zaka group members texting and and soliciting donations of which they got you know hundreds of millions in the very like key hours when they should have been properly handling these this you know these these poor people's remains and and even to this day and i don't know if you have confirmation of that a lot of the community members who's uh, who were attacked on that day are not able to access their homes because they are actually being controlled in order to continue this propaganda um, campaign, there are tours being offered of their homes to randos, Jerry Seinfeld, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, Zaka basically, the, you know, the first casualty of war is truth, right? And so we've heard this narrative just everywhere about the reason there's no forensic evidence is because of the Jewish religion, right? That there was chaos and that a Jewish ritual demands that bodies be buried immediately and that uh, Zaka, the, the Times actually says they're on a holy mission, right? Which, which is crazy. They're on a holy mission to like uh, fundraise off of corpses. The Haaretz actually has a photo of them with like a corpse in a body bag and they're sitting at a table making fundraising videos and they pulled in at least $13 million. I think it's more because we identified millions of dollars from uh, other sources, but at least 13, uh, million dollars. And meanwhile, they're completely uh, making hash, like literal, of uh, of the bodies. What you said is right, right? They're mixing uh, different people's remains in the same body bags. They're leaving remains uncollected. Mm -hmm. they, they are also rebagging remains from IDF body bags into Zaka body bags for publicity. Oh, boy. And, and, and they're leaving behind remains in the old body bag and including forensic evidence like bullets, right? And so it is just the height of anti-Semitism to claim there's no forensics because of religion when it is just this like gross cash grab because Zaka was completely bankrupt on October 7th. And so there was basically this deal made that Zaka in return for their atrocity propaganda. And we have like, you know, in, in the reports I've done, one of the leading uh, officials, Yossi Landau, in four different interviews, he talks about fabricating stories. He says, we use our imagination. The bodies is telling us stories. Right, they're outright and he they're literal crisis actors. He's on like at the Jerusalem press club weeping over this pregnant mother who's butchered and the fetus is taken out and stabbed. And Haaretz is like, this did not happen. Israeli news channels, and that's the crazy thing. Like is Israeli media, as as problematic as they are, have really been in the lead of showing how all this stuff is fake. And none of it makes it into the U.S. media because yes. I guess it would be anti-Semitic. Well, that's like so key. I mean, because really it's not for Israel. It's for the Western, the rest of the Western audience or whatever, I guess the United States and anyone who would continue to fund this, um, which and, and I guess I wanted to ask you, to your knowledge, have any of the accounts been retracted? Um, and for example, I just, I mean, the screams without words, which is that New York times article that, that has been debunked a million times, um, that is still up like the New York and th there's no disclaimers on this, this article about supposedly Hamas using rape as a, yeah, a weapon of war in, again, as you say, these two hours. Right. Right. But basically every, uh, incident in that article has been debunked. But you know, when, when it came out, I, I was laughing because I'd already been looking into it uh, for a month because everyone they interviewed, I was already familiar with the case. And it's just like the Times really didn't uncover anything new. The lead story is about uh, the woman in the black dress, Gal Abdush, who there's this video of her corpse with the dress up. And it's claimed just from this video uh, that she was raped, right? So in other words, the New York Times has become like 9-11 conspiracy theorists. They're like, look, look at this video. This proves it was an inside right. job. You know, the idea just, it's just like, this is war. Shit happens in war. She was blown up. And it's just like, right. oh, you know, well, maybe like grenades might have like, uh, you know, done something. And you could see her face is all burnt. It, the flesh is burnt down Jeez. to the skull. And it's just like, yeah, it's just like but shit happens focus, in war. Right, and then they focus on the idea as if rape is somehow worse, or is it you're claiming kind of a better propagandistic tool if you want to dehumanize an entire people and population and justify this mass atrocity? And what and that's a great point, because what we should remember is from the beginning, it's been nothing but a torrent of propaganda, right? And no one has really believed the Israeli propaganda. No one believed, the, the, you know, that 
the propaganda about there were Hamas command and control centers in the hospitals that, you know, right. uh, the, all the beheaded baby stuff, um, all the stuff about UNRWA employees um, were involved in October 7th attacks. But the one thing people have believed, even on the left, even progressives, is the rape claims. Uh, both Katha Pollitt and Jill Filipovich had columns denouncing feminists for not believing Israeli women. You know, and it's, it's just utterly insane. Israel has weaponized Me Too and feminism as rape as, and as a weapon of war. Yeah, yeah, as well as, um, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, <laughs> what's his? Anthony Blinken? No, no, no. And then I'm Anthony Blinken. Oh, do uh, uh, disinvited Martha's Vineyard guest, um, Epstein uh, Island uh, friend, Alan D Dershowitz. Dersh Dershi. <laughs> Dershi. Dershi. Dersh Dershi's calling us all out. He's like, <laughs> uh, me too, except if you're a Jew. Remember that line? That was awful. Um, that so wasn't just a line. That was a whole campaign. And and you know, and that's really important because what what. One of the things that Israel was, was up to, and again, they admitted outright, th this is an inversion of the reality, right? That's a whole thing about Jim Crow Ray poxes. We can go back to Native American captivity narratives, which were false stories about white women being raped in the 1700s by, by Native Americans. It completely inverts the sexual violence, right? By basically law from the church and monarchies, uh, uh, the colonizers, con conquistadors, were allowed to rape native women under slavery. That was mm -hmm. what the slave masters did. They raped I black mean, women. Yeah. During Jim Crow, black, brown, indigenous women were raped and they had no recourse because they had very little standing in, in courts. The U.S. then took this abroad with empire, right, you know, in Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, something like 50,000 Iraqi women and girls at just one point were forced uh, into sexual, being sexually trafficked because the society was destroyed. So, and what Israel is doing now is they are engaging in this massive systematic gender and sexual based violence against Palestinian women that UN women's groups are trying to highlight and bring attention to. Mm. You know, the fact that there, um, at one point there were 50,000 Uh, pregnant women with no neonatal care, right? They're giving birth in the most barbaric conditions, hundreds of birth complications a week, 100,000 women who are lactating, whose breast milk is, is drying up, the destruction of sanitation that is devastating menstrual health. Then on top, that's gender-based violence. Then there's the sexual violence right. of Palestinian women, numerous accounts, and we have survivors. We have who have spoken, I've been collecting all these videos, it's horrifying, but these distraught women in Gaza speaking to the camera, talking about these different stories of Israeli soldiers raiding their homes, mm -hmm. killing family members, and then forcing all the women to strip na naked, degrading them, mocking them, sometimes uh, uh, searching them, which is basically when you're searching a naked woman, that's sexual assault, right? And we saw also those photos of all those men being paraded Oh, you know, yeah. uh, semi-naked, that is also sexual violence, oh, yeah. right? And so that is getting zero attention while the fake Israeli claims are dominating uh, the right. media. Right. I mean, it, and it's, and it, there's, yeah, it is so, dis, I mean, it's grotesque and it's a perfect example of obviously anything that the Israeli government or the IDF claim um, is something that they themselves actually are doing. And as a weapon of war, I mean, I don't even think you can call this a war by any stretch, right? Uh, where is the line? We just talked about how uh, they're bombing people in their homes back with their families. That's not war. That's a, just a straight up, you know, war crime, right? There's no mm -hmm. law rules of engagement being exercised here. Um, you know, you could argue by Hamas, but also by definitely by the actual, as you said, second most advanced military in the world. You actually did speak before we leave the sort of mass rape stuff. You spoke to some of the, uh, you know, victims who were named in some of these reports. Um, it, it like what are what's their experience of the way that their stories have been weaponized? Um, specifically, I think that that the family members of that couple 
whose name I, I yeah I, I spoke to the relatives of Gal and Nagi Abdush they were a uh, couple who were featured in the New York Times report uh, uh, screams without words and they totally disputed uh, the notion that uh, Gal Abdush was raped uh, because it turns out the New York Times in the report they referenced various text messages phone calls voicemails but they left out the fact that there's this one voicemail at uh, or one text message at 651 where Galab Dush says the uh, uh, explosions at the border are insane. We're getting in the car and leaving. Mm. Nine minutes later, the husband leaves a voicemail for uh, his brother. And I talked to his brother um, that says Gal has been shot in the heart and is dying. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that nine minutes, according to the New York Times, this couple is like captured by Hamas, um, that Galab Dush is raped by uh, Hamas. Um, she's shot. Her body is burned. And meanwhile, neither Gal or Nagi are happening to mention any of this to their family that, mm -hmm. she, you know, she's being attacked. It, it's just a complete lie, I think we can say, just like every other one is, except this one Israeli woman who was in, in captivity. Right, and right, so, right, right. And, and, and the, the, yeah, sorry, keep going. Well, this, this is the atrocity propaganda that's being used to justify the war because Hamas equals ISIS and all Palestinians are Hamas, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's that, and we also heard like constantly, like, you know, to have the German chancellor, it's just like, they're just like ISIS. And it's just like, what is up with Germany? It, it, it never meets a genocide that it uh, uh, doesn't want to support, <laughs> you know? For, for real. Um, Deanne, I also, if you ever, if you want to weigh in, um, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, I, I think it is, again, you just hear one of these stories, these fabricated stories, and a lot of people are like, that's all I need. That's all I need to dehumanize an entire population and wash my hands of this. I don't need to read anything else. I don't need to learn anything else. It fits in with my, you know, sort of anti-Arab Islamophobic worldview anyway. And let's be on our way and mission accomplished from an Israeli propaganda level. Um, now, and let's ping pong back, Arun to Zaka group because they have an incredibly shady past that somehow the New York Times, the CNN, uh, all these other outlets have no trouble quoting or getting their information from Zaka, but they don't even talk about what this group has done. Or And so tell us. Oh, it is just absolutely bonkers. And it, again, this is all over Israeli media. You know, it's, it's on news channel. It's on Haaretz, it's it's in the Times of Israel, which is a right wing publication, the Yehadot Haraknat, which is like you know known as the New York Times of Israel. So basically, what the story is is uh, the there's a precursor to Zaka that's founded in about 1990 by Yehuda Meshi Zahab, and in 95 it it officially becomes Zaka, and it's mm -hmm. these ultra orthodox Haredi men who they're basically after these mass casualty attacks, right? It could be a traffic accident, but this was also what the era where you start to have suicide bombings. Right, they come right. in and collect human remains. And so they're presented, you know, like I said, the New York Times is like, oh, they're on a holy mission. Right, you know, they're volunteers, they, can, they arrive on the scene. Right, okay. but the real story is just, so absolutely bonkers because what it starts with is Yehudi Yehuda Meshi Zahav. He's part of this uh, sect, Natori Karta. They're the anti-Zionist Jews. They're the ones who show up at all the Palestinian rights demonstrations. Right. You know, with saying like, you know, we're against Israel, and and which is correct theologically because Israel is only supposed to be established when the Jewish Messiah uh, arrives. So they take the theology seriously. So, but he's part of this Jewish underground terrorist group that is basically targeting other Jews for violating halakha, that is Jewish law. So they're going after Jews who are driving on the Sabbath. They're going after archeologists who are digging up remains. And here's the real kicker. They're going after forensic pathologists, right? It's back to the forensic pathology because they're defiling bodies and they're keeping remains that need to be buried right away. So Zaka 
is sending these forensic pathologists and their children. First of all, they're like planting fake bombs outside their homes. They're sending them envelopes with a bullet and a letter that says this time it's in the mail, right? Basically outright death threats. So they, right. So they're this ultra Orthodox group that actually like, so they, so to, to your earlier point, do they kind of believe, does their sort of like extremism believe that like you should bury bodies immediately and we can't do forensic studies that you were saying? Exactly. That okay. is like, if you go look up Zaka uh, and what they do, the number one thing they advertise is they have a whole legal team to prevent autopsies from happening. Right. So these are the guys who end up making a complete mess of the forensic after wild. October 7th. It's wild that you would sick this group who's just like known for feel for, it's like using their religion, their their interpretation right. of their religion, of course, um, to be like, oh, yeah, these guys are the ones who are going to get to the bottom of exactly what happened to, you know, the, right. the you know, people who are attacked right. by Hamas. Like, oh, no, the guys who literally don't believe in getting to the bottom of what happened. <laughs> That's wild. So the other crazy element, as 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 Yehuda is part of this, and it, apparently he led this group when he was a young man, like in his late teens or early twenties. He's also let's he's rapey McRape face, right? So starting in the nineteen eighty, we should workshop that name, but okay. <laughs> he 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 is raping boys and girls and young women, some as young as five years old. Oh my God. And so I didn't even include this in, in one of my stories. This is the founder. The founder, Yehudi, Yehuda Meshi Zahav. And so, uh, and this, everyone in the community knows it, right? Because the um, uh, ultra Orthodox community is extremely insular. And it's also, there's this whole principle, you never tell anyone on the outside. You're mm -hmm. a moser, which is, you know, a snitch. So you never say anything uh, to anyone on the outside. And so the rabbis knew it, Zaka knew it, everyone knew it, like kids knew it. You know, like there was this one adult who came forward, basically skipping forward in 2021, Yehuda was uh, going to be awarded the Israeli prize. That is the highest civilian award. It's the equivalent of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That was too much for his victims. And suddenly they just, lots of them started to come forward. This is what he did to us, right? So the prize is revoked. He tries to commit suicide by hanging himself. Unsuccessful, he slips into a coma, uh, dies a year later. But these accounts are just all so crazy. Like, is is one now That's, adult? Uh, we've got the Epstein link here. We finally, we you've you've come right the, the, Epstein, the Epstein the, link. the yeah. Epstein Island, right? So he he said so he Yehuda would come into these Orthodox neighborhoods in his new cars, and he was getting new cars from Zaka, and he would invite us into his car and kids into his car, and then he would get busy with them. And this guy said, quote, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't hear this. We, we saw it and we experienced it. So, and the thing is, there were multiple police investigations that were closed. Yehuda and two of his brothers were also, one of them was convicted of raping a female relative. Another uh, was uh, under investigation for abusing uh, seven uh, Orthodox uh, girls who were like in group homes. And they're using Zaka resources. They're giving them money. They're giving them cell phones. They're giving them Zaka certificates. Because the thing was, there's not a lot for young men to do in these communities. Mm. And, and you know, let's forget about young women because they're basically treated as uh, baby machines. Right. And so Zaka be became seen as something very positive because it was an outlet for these young men. And so for Yehuda, this became a way for him to, like, uh, be a predator, right? So this was completely known through this the- This is uh, why, just, I just want to say, because this is wild in that, you know, you've got an organization like UNRWA, like a reputable organization that is now, because of more lies told by Israel, it has been completely defunded by the United States, um, starving Palestinians because of unsubstantiated claims. And again, like if you so much, I mean, Arun, you know, 
if you so much as give an award to a Palestinian poet, if you so much as invite a Palestinian to speak about the occupation in a university, if you so much as have an association with the people of Palestine, you will be um, obviously like fired or, you know, a, a campaign against you by like, you know, propagandists here. You'll be called anti-Semitic. You'll be, uh, yeah, not given job opportunities. You'll have to resign from your post as a president of a university because of your loose associations with, I'm sorry, uh, a colonized oppressed people. In, in exchange, you have this completely disreputable organization that is being lifted up by Western media and completely like hook, line and sinker. And they're not even issuing apologies. Sorry, this organization is a super extremist Orthodox organization and f also founded by a pedophile that like has, you know, tens of rape victims. So our bad, maybe we shouldn't quote them. <laughs> I, I think it may actually be hundreds. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like Zaka itself, it, uh, uh, Yehuda Meshi Zahav and his brothers are probably raped hundreds of, of Israelis, which is far more than all the fake rape claims combined. But the story just keeps getting crazier, right? So in the Orthodox communities, there are modesty patrols, right? And we, all, we hear all the time, oh, Iran and Saudi Arabia are so bad. They've got these modesty patrols, right? Vigilantes. And that is bad, but it also exists in Israel. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they totally knew about uh, Yehuda. And they hatched a plot that they were going to catch him red-handed and castrate him. And so they did catch him red handed, right? He was diddling with like some teenage boy or something. Christ. And but he escaped their clutches. This is about 1989. And so he basically then had no future in the community or in the Tory Carta. So this is when he found he makes his peace with Zionism. He accepts the Israeli state and he founds the precursor to Zaka. So basically the story is oh. he founded Zaka's so he could continue his rapey activities. You know, that's the- Oh, oh. so he was he was with the rabbi. I knew I didn't woot the rabbi. I mean, well, it doesn't, that, that doesn't represent all of them, but whatever. But so he, right. He was with this, the anti-Zionist. What is the-, th the Notori Carta. Notori Carta. Okay, right. I got it. And so then once he does embrace Zionism, he's like, no, 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 Israeli state, all good. That's when- but he had been operating in Israel, correct? Like yes, yes, that's when, yes, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so that's when that so, collusion with the state happens, or that that collaboration right. with the state. Okay. Right. And so during the nineties, when when you have these suicide bombings by Islamic Jihad and and Hamas, you know, buses being blown up, it's Zaka and their other private religious organizations are forming these like you know, rescue and, and, you know, these teams to like go in and recover remains. And they're going in, they're fighting over who has like the authority at the scene. They're also fighting over who can get pictures first, right? This is another thing we've heard. Oh, we don't take pictures because we're re religious. They're fighting over who can first take pictures and videos and send them to the media so they can use them as fundraising. Oh, and could sure. you imagine like you were on a bus and it's blown up and you've got like the shin bone from the bus driver like sticking through your stomach and these guys are arguing who gets to take a picture of you first? And you're like, uh, can I get a little um, help here before uh, I die? You know, no, I mean, I think it's it. I mean, I'm trying to think of a corollary. But if like an extremist Christian fundamentalist group were like with before the EMTs fundraising off of like my like my tragedy or my the, like the murder or the murder of a family member. I mean, I, I, I just I mean, look, th this week also Israelis are, you know, there was a massive protest in, or not massive protest, but a protest in the Knesset. They're fucking fed up, as they should be. Um, but, uh, Deanne, you have no questions, right? Like, everything's super clear, like, it makes <laughs> sense. We, how sure. we launder all this information. I mean, yeah, the, the only question, and I think I probably speak for your listeners, is what the fuck? <laughs> um, I, I definitely oh, don't have... It keeps getting crazier. 
<laughs> well, we have to we, wrap soon, Arun, though. So, okay. So, so basically, Yehuda and his brothers set up a, <laughs> a, a dozen crime novel I've ever. I like don't want to finish <laughs> reading it. They set up a dozen dozen shell organizations to fundraise for Zaka. They take 50% off the top. They very quickly got into financial trouble. And there, so we know this because there's court appointed auditors who are demanding, telling them you've got to stop doing this. And they're basically going like this. They're going around the world, raising millions of dollars. They're spending it on new on cars. On the state of Israel? Well, no, on behalf of on, Zaka. Uh, their work. Behalf, yeah, okay. Yeah, they, they set up a dozen. There, if you Google Zaka, there are all these different Zaka groups still, right? right? And so they're fundraising all this money. There's a uh, Yehuda is living in this multi million dollar uh, villa. They're spending it on plane flights, five star luxury hotels, paying their food bills, new cars. So it just this is the Enron part, right? It becomes this giant grift. Right. That that they're to take. My favorite story is about how they would get donors to throw down big money to buy a motorcycle, and then when you know however much it cost twenty thirty you know ten twenty thirty thousand dollars, and when they did, they would put a plaque on the motorcycle in the name of the donor. But then they go to another donor saying, "Buy us a motorcycle," and then when he did. They would just switch the plaque out with the name of the new donor. Like they did this multiple times. It is such a blatant grip. Wow. And, and, and so they basically get into all this trouble. And so this is why there's essentially a deal with the devil is made on October 7th, that the Israeli unit that's trained to go in and recover remains and preserve forensic evidence is told to stand down. The commanders are begging the Israeli home command, let us go in, and they're told no. And they're not allowed in for the first week. Meanwhile, Zaka is going in, using corpses as fundraising. At one point, they made a music video as oh, for, oh, for, fund, for fundraising. And they're doing these donor tours, right? So Israelis can't go back to these devastated communities, but you know, and I'd, I'd love to see how this works. Like, do they have this menu of option? You know, for five thousand dollars, you can see a burnt out home, but for for sure. for, for twenty thousand, you can see a corpse, and for fifty thousand, we'll show you that baby in the oven. You know, and it's it's just like no, it's that's so, how sick it is. It's so crazy, and if you okay, were to so just turn of... this into a straight up screenplay, you would be like denounced as the biggest Nazi on the planet, and it's all <laughs> true. They'd be like, "This is a little far fetched for us." <laughs> um, I do think that I feel like Zaka is like the Giuliani of October seventh. You know, Giuliani is like, like his his whole shit was turned around from nine eleven. Right. Like it's the makeover he needed and then he squandered it. But uh there they you know, it's like Zaka not doing well. October seventh, turned it around. Um, Arun Gupta, we'll link to your articles. Uh they're excellent and detailed. And thank you for doing all of this work and, and for speaking with, you know, the family members of the, you know, victims and, and debunking this because it is important to like, yes, yes, one baby is too many, and yes, one rape victim is too many, but this is absolutely um, a fabrication me meant to justify us, uh, ju justify genocide. Um, yeah, look for my piece coming out, industrial scale version of Jim Crow rape hoaxes. This is why we have to debunk it. And folks can also subscribe to my Substack, Life, the Universe, and Most Things. Um, nice. So that's where I put all my writing. Arun Gupta, uh, we can, okay, find him on his Substack. Final is writing. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you as always. And Deanne, you signed up for a lot. You are a good sport. <laughs> but uh, you're still here, right? Of course. Podcast listeners don't know that you're still here. I am definitely still here. I just, you listen, I don't, I needed to hear Arun talk. I, I didn't have anything <laughs> to contribute of value other than what the fuck, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's. That's right on. I think the biggest question is when will not just I mean, Biden, I don't know, but when will media outlets actually apologize? I mean, this is egregious. Like uh, they I, I don't I mean, you you don't even have a retraction. You don't have a disclaimer like it's 
it, it's it's ridiculous. It's like there needs to be this is how we got hoodwinked in the aftermath of October 7th. Um, here we go. And, and you can highlight the actual family of, you know, the baby who was killed or you can highlight, you know, th this this couple who was killed, but but not in the way that it has been propagandized to all of us. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can just say that it worked. You know, I, I have a lot of family members that are your typical white, uncritically thinking Americans. And mm -hmm. they heard this and that was it. You know, yeah, 100 percent. That's all yeah. they needed to know. Mm -hmm. And they can just put it in the like, you know, don't have to think about it because it's justified box. Speaking of justification, I mean, uh, this is it's wild. Anyway, I'm still waiting on an apology from all my liberal Zionist friends, but uh, I don't, I'm not going <laughs> to hold my breath because yeah. I like air. Anyway, we have a final segment. Again, back to our uh, class war theme. Class war, real war, propaganda war. It's all kinds of wars. Um, I'm going to start a new segment. We always start new segments, and then sometimes we continue them, sometimes we don't. But I'm going to start a class war segment because it is tax day. It's very important to know uh, just how much the billionaires – are actually paying versus how much we are paying. So this is class war taxes. Hell yeah. So I don't know if you, Deanna, have, have were exposed to this um, report that ProPublica did a couple years ago about the amount of taxes that uh, – billionaires have been paying and they got access to a bunch of IRS files. They didn't say how they still haven't said how I'm assuming some kind of like fight club situation, like go and, you know, like dig through some trash. Very exciting uh, over at ProPublica, but no. Um, and they're like, it is staggering what the rich have been able to get away with. Um, I do want to remind everybody and you, the median American household earned about $70,000 annually and they paid about 14% of that in federal taxes. And let me just tell you from personal experience, I'm looking at what I owe in taxes and going, how, <laughs> how, how is that the percentage? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, but I did want to ask, and just, you know, you don't have to necessarily, it's okay. You can, if you ballpark this number, it's fine. I want to ask you about a few different billionaires, um, and how much you think they paid in taxes. Uh, there's just three. It's easy. Um, but what do you think Elon good, the good, uh, <laughs> the, the good middle-aged life crisis, uh, Nazi Ooh. paid in federal, federal income taxes in the year 2018, 2018. Oh, man. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just going to make up a number, but I'm going to say, I'm just going to put it out there that even if it was like 4 million, it was too little. I'm going to say 4 million. I like that number, four million. That's good. It's good. It's like it's like a big number for us, but like a small number for him. That's kind of yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I like this. Um, the answer is zero. <laughs> is he a church? How did that happen? <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, a lot of his fans would like it to be. They would absolutely uh, get baptized in his holy water slash semen. Um, yeah. No, that is sorry. Yeah, that's zero. That's going to be a big zero. Um, how about Carl Lichen, who I mentioned earlier? Um, he uh, ranks as the 40th wealthiest American uh, on the Forbes list. And what did he pay in both 2016 and 2017 in federal taxes? Uh, again, I feel like the answer might be zero. I'm going to, I'm going to say 4 million. I'm gonna say it's four zero. Million. It is zero. No federal income taxes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to not, it's not the rule of threes here, but Michael Bloomberg in 2018 um, he made $2 billion. <laughs> How much did he pay in taxes? I can't fathom these numbers. Like I truly cannot. Oh, like, that's a cool two bill. I'm um, going to say even 500 million is a drop in the bucket to this guy. I'm going to say 500 million. No. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter? Are you kidding? Um, right? No, he paid 70 million in taxes. So that's not zero. But it's a 3.7 tax rate. Remember what I said at the beginning? 14% tax rate is what most Americans are throwing down. Here was a little bit more. that All this is from their article, ProPublica, oh. a couple years ago. Here's a little bit more of how much they their wealth grew by, how much they reported as their income, and then what 
taxes they paid. Now, remember, what we're talking about is income taxes. And what the what the wealthy do is they don't actually pay themselves that much. They have all their money in their assets and then they borrow using that money. And, you know, they put it all on credit, basically. And that's how they live their fucking lives. And then they get to die. And that's apparently like an even like they call it like like. Uh, buy, borrow, die. Like that's their scheme. So you have Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Baron, I guess. He His wealth grew in, this is, I forgot which year was this, but it was one year. Wealth grew by $24.3 billion. He only reported $125 million. $24 billion. No wonder he's the only billionaire who's like, um, you guys really need to tax me more. <laughs> um, and he paid point. 10 percent of taxes he paid 23.7 million in taxes um but in terms of what they calculated was true tax rate which means based on how much your wealth grew so if income was actually calculated by how much richer you got which it really is for all the rest of us but it's not when you're that rich when you have everything in assets or stocks or whatnot that he actually was taxed at a 0.10 percent rate well, I can tell you that this is emboldening me to uh, increase some of my quote expenses. Oh, you better deduct, baby. Deduct everything. Uh, Jeff Bezos, $99 billion in wealth growth. He reported only $4.22 billion and he paid $973 million, which is a 0.98. Ooh, almost a whole percentage point or a point percentage point. Um, Michael Bloomberg, again, uh, a little bit more there, uh, 22%, uh, 22 and a half billion reported 10 billion, which is actually pretty honest, um, but paid 292 million. Apparently, Bloomberg's got a whole other scheme going for him. Um, and that's 1.3% of his true tax rate. Elon Musk wealth grew by 13 and, a, and 0.9 billion, reported 1.5 billion only paid 455 million and that's 3.27 percent Ooh, crazy these percentages crazy. are like they're not even like extra percentages that i pay when i order uber eats do you know what i mean like it's so negligible <laughs> that like three percent to us at this point post post quote pandemic means nothing everything you know all of that's us are such getting a good like, way to think about it yeah little percentages here and there added on to everything constantly yeah they have they take more of a loss just like you know when they have to remodel their floors in their like third vacation house they're just you know like that's or whatever the fuck like they, this is nothing to them but they're still freaked out about actually joe biden's plans now these are not radical plans but Biden does have some plans to change our tax structure, uh, according to the Los Angeles Times. And this is in that same article about how all the billionaires are you know, flocking to Trump once more. He wants to increase taxes by four point three trillion dollars. Uh, obviously, you know, most of that is for Israel. So, you know, <laughs> huh? you're welcome. Um, taxpayers with incomes above one hundred thousand four hundred thousand dollars a year would face a thirty nine point six tax rate up from thirty seven percent. So that's like. Pretty f which, anyway, I'll get to my point. Those with incomes over a million would see their capital gains taxes increase. Again, capital gains ca taxes are really small. Private equity firms and hedge fund owners would also take a hit. Biden would change the laws on so on taxing so-called pass-through income, ending provisions that greatly benefit them. So you, when you move money around, you don't have to get taxed. They, this would end that. And then taxpayers with stocks, bonds, and other capital assets worth over, again, if you're getting scared because you got a little bit of stock, no, over a hundred million, my guess is you don't, could also face a new 20 25% tax on the increase in the value of their holdings. So that's just on the increase. That's not on what they've put into the stock market or their that a hundred million. It's just what it gained, what it gained by. Um, and that's that has them running scared. And Deanne, what's interesting to me about these numbers when you look, and when I read that ProPublic article initially was not not necessarily the billionaires are getting away with paying next to nothing, but that those middle, like if you're making over like 500,000 or like a million, that those people are actually being taxed at a, a more fair rate than billionaires, meaning they have more in common with working class folks than they do billionaires. And yet 
so many of those people, I mean, you can think of like media figures. I mean, media figures might make more money than that, but like maybe, you know, tech folks or people sort of mid-level management shit, you know, Hollywood industry people, people who get 500,000, like these people should be joining us in the class war against billionaires because their tax rate based on what they own is actually way like they're, they are bearing the brunt in some ways. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I am glad I understand what you're saying because I don't have enough wealth, nor will I ever probably to, to understand capital gains. So I'm happy that I can dig into this portion of the conversation. <laughs> I mean, I'm barely understand, but I think this is like, it's like, we're all kind of catching on, you know, yeah. it's like the 2008, like subprime mortgage crisis at leading to the financial crash. It's like you, you split this into how many different parts and sold it for a profit, but like bet against your own, like what? Like, but this is even easier to understand because we simply don't treat like, hmm. I'm trying to think something like, you know, if we treated like my DVD collection the way <laughs> or my like secondhand shirts or like my like jackets I should probably get rid of in the way that we treat the amount of wealth that these rich people hoard, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel like I could get a significant write-off is what I mean. Um, I say do it. I say all bets are off. No rules apply. I, do what you gotta I do. I a tax person that really wants to cheat with me. I just, uh, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm missing out here. Um, Deanne Smith, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been great. Uh, Listen, I want to say my pleasure. I enjoy you and your show a lot, but you know, everything remains a nightmare, but, um, well, we've I, solved most of it, obviously in the last <laughs> hour and a half. Yeah. Collective revolution and nobody pay your taxes. It's a good start. Exactly. Um, you, and like, and then by the way, just like icing on the class warfare cake, like remember that the Republican party wants to defund the IRS that they want. And when you do not properly fund the IRS, first of all, you leave trillions of dollars on the table from our already broken tax code, our already unfair tax code. But on top of that, Eunice, you basically not force them, but they go after middle-class people mm -hmm. who don't have lawyers and accountants and whatnot, or, you know, armies of accountants and lawyers to, to just make up for the loss. So like the, the idea that you or I would be audited is actually more likely than the idea that one of these rich mofos will be audited. Ridiculous. Um, where can people find you and follow your work and see you live? <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'm on I'm on Instagram more than anything, and that's my name, Deanne underscore Smith, uh, DeanneSmith.com. And I have two shows coming up in some major cities. Uh, New York on April 25th is a show nice. I do called Deanarchy, uh, and I invite other people yeah. on that show. It's fun. And then May 12th is uh, just an hour in L.A. That's part Ooh. of the Netflix is a joke festival. Netflix is trash, but my hour will be good. And that's an May 12th. hour for Netflix is a joke festival. That's tight. It's not taped or anything. It's just, you know, it's a show. It's a live show. Um, no, no. But still, that's really dope. That's great. Um, I hope so. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. Uh, I want to come out to that. Um, thank you so much, Deanne. Take good care. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you all for sticking around for all this content. Uh, I'm going to read some super chats. I was not able to flag some of your comments, so I apologize because I actually don't flag comments. That's Paige. And Paige is not here right now. Um, Benjamin Morrill, thank you for being a member on YouTube for two months. Says, Sister, just happy you're out here fighting the fighting by informing right on Hermosa. Free Palestine. Why well, I know. Good ass, yes. Benjamin Morrill, thank you for your super chat. Sheesh, I meant or hermana. Oi. Oh, did you just... Never mind. It's... I just... Okay. Um, Zach Benna said... Uh, thank you for your super chat. Says, what's more flamboyant? Guesses or conclusions as to how the world is? Like, I think poop is a symmetrical... Is a symmetric word. And there's agreement that everyone can say poop. It's jewel like jewelry and makeup for our feces. I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but I will take your money. So you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I like the word poop. Stoneflower Dragon gifted five memberships on YouTube. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you. And Robert, if God wanted billionaires to pay taxes, he wouldn't have made politicians so bribable. 
I feel like that's what they're saying at Mar-a-Lago. Are you excusing that? Um, just wild. But with that, everybody, um, <clears throat> let me get up my fart song that I did not load preload. Um, but here we go. Thanking everyone, all the patrons, $10 or more and, uh, go over to Twitch. I will go over to Twitch right now with the fart song. <laughs> Thank you so much to Marcus Aurelius for becoming a patron at $10 or more. Lynn Busby. To Paul, thank you for editing your pledge to become part of the Fran Girl? The Franny Pack? Yeah. Um, thank you so, so, so much. And over on Twitch, thank you, Chris Huggy. Uh, love you back. Thank you, Mike Boy for Mayor, resubscribing with Prime. This guy got flipped off at the open mic before me, so I didn't get a fair chance. That's very funny. Um, uh, thank you so much to GatsbyCat22 for subscribing. T Girly 70 and Ramona the Lucky Cat. Uh, my cat is very much a uh, lucky cat. Thank you to Paige Omek, to Maximilian Inhoff, and to Andy Vasoyan, especially who's been doing some heavy lifting lately as we expand the number of days we stream. Again, no show on Friday, but we will have a show tomorrow uh, available to watch and listen back for the patrons, but you can watch it live on YouTube and Twitch. Thank you, everybody. Follow the show, Bituation Pod on Twitter, um, TikTok and Instagram, Bituation Room. Uh, and remember to fight the power, to fuck the patriarchy, to free Palestine, and don't just bitch about it, be about it. Good bye. Mm -hmm.